Hello, and welcome to This Week in Government. I'm Tina Evans, and today we have the pleasure of interviewing and speaking with uh, the Minister, uh, the Attorney General, and Minister of Legal Affairs, mm -hmm. the Honorable Kathy Lynn Simmons. Uh, it's a delight to have her on, this, on the set today. We're gonna talk about some of the initiatives that are going on within the ministry and some of the plans for the future in this legislative year. Um, AG, I, I affectionately everybody calls you AG, mm -hmm. which is your correct title, <laughs> AG and Minister. Uh, AG Simmons, it's good to have you here today with us. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and in saying that, um, I called you AG and not, not Minister. Mm -hmm. Some people don't still to this day understand your role and how this dual role, how does it play out? Can you explain, just give our audience an sure. understanding? So I am the Attorney General and the Minister of Legal Affairs, formerly Ministry of Legal Affairs and Constitution Reform, okay? Um, it's a dual role. So the Attorney General is the government's principal legal advisor. And what I'm responsible for is the production of legislation through parliamentary council and we also have a civil advisory section where we do civil litigation and we give advice to government departments. Mm -hmm. So that's the Attorney General's role. I also advise the cabinet on legal matters as well. As a minister, like all other ministers, I am responsible for implementing and executing the government's policy initiatives as they pertain to the administration of justice. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, somebody said, "What well, does she go to court?" I mean, or do you have who? Who? who I have eminently qualified and experienced counsel who appear regularly on civil matters on my behalf. On the behalf of the mm -hmm. the attorney general. So then, um, and, and and we're going to get into a lot of stuff that you're doing. You know, a lot of work that's going on. But um, so, where does the judiciary and the Department of Public prosecutions for with okay. they are all constitutionally independent departments that fall under the ministry for administrative purposes only the judiciary is the sitting justices the judicial department is the administrative branch of the judiciary let's put it this way they provide support in that regard um, the director of public prosecution sits separately and she is responsible for criminal prosecution. So they're all constitutionally independent, but we exercise budgetary oversight and some administrative oversight, but not of their programs and not of their staff. Yeah, okay. yeah, and it's, it's funny because some people will mix up. No, we don't do criminal prosecutions. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. some people will mix up and they, the director of public prosecutions is Cindy Clark. Mm -hmm. And some people will mix it up and say, well, why did the AG not do something yeah. like no yeah. this is this yeah. is yeah okay well thank you for explaining mm -hmm. that now <clears throat> one of the things that you've been attorney general now how long almost seven years wow excellent yeah. congratulations yeah. thank you uh, good tenure one of the things that you've done uh, amongst many but i think one that people were so excited about and pleased that you were bold enough and i'm going to use that word to do it was the sexual, the public notifi notification of sex offenders release. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Previous attorney generals did not do it, mm -hmm. but you came in and did it. Why? Tell us why. So our job is to be responsive to the needs in the community, and as sexual offending was on the increase, it became necessary to make sure that we provided the necessary safeguards to our community, particularly our vulnerable people, by providing the notifications that Tom is going to be released. Okay, we don't have a public sex offender register, but what I do is provide notifications once I receive information from corrections on the profile of the offender and what level of risk he poses to the community in terms of reoffending. If he is deemed to be high risk, absolutely, I will, with consultation um, with the commissioner of police, give a public notification. And that gives the public warning that Tom is coming out on such and such a date. This is where he or she will reside. And it acts as a safeguard for um, community protection. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, you use a word there, I think, that is important that people understand. Because someone will say, well, you didn't notify us when this person mm -hmm. came out, mm -hmm. but you're notifying us when this person came mm -hmm. out. But you said there's a risk assessment. Yeah, absolutely. So what's provided to me is an entire psychological assessment of the offender. I have an overview of what um, um, rehabilitation measures took place within the correction facility. And the psychologist gives a recommendation at the end of it mm -hmm. and determines 
with all the clarity that's possible whether or not this person will reoffend. And based on the information provided to me, I make the decision. There are times, I must confess, when I don't um, act in accordance with the recommendation from the psychologist. There are times when the offender may not be deemed to be high risk, but may not have um, undertaking the rehabil rehabilitation courses, um, programs, and I determine for public safety reasons that it's necessary to give that notification. One of the things that's difficult is the public's um, justifiable reaction to these offenders. And what people need to realize is that we have correction facilities now. We don't have prisons. Okay, and these people are expected to be reintegrated into the community. And so we do everything that we can to assist in rehabilitation. And so it's in our collective best interest not to further vilify these people, but to make sure that necessary protections are in place upon their release. It's been very challenging to make sure that they are gainfully employed, that they have somewhere to reside. So all of the social protections that, you know, are available to other members of the public, it's challenging when somebody is being released without the safety net of those protections. But we do what we can and we're aided, I mean, in a great way by the offender risk management team. And that was a newly legislated team and that consists of um, representatives from BPS, as Bermuda Police Service, Corrections, and also um, court services. Mm -hmm. They are responsible for monitoring the offender once they're released into the community. And they also assess the level of risk that they present because obviously extraneous factors come into play and the risk goes up. Yeah. You know, you can imagine someone who's not gainfully employed, who doesn't have family support, who doesn't have stable housing, and what that means to their mental state and their ability to be effectively accepted and reintegrated into the community. So there are challenges all around, but we're satisfied that we've met it with a legislative response that's being played out in practical terms successfully. Okay. Um, you, you have also tackled um, in, in these years, years, seven years, uh, safeguarding for vulnerable persons. Um, and I know you've done so many amendments to the Criminal, co the, to the criminal uh, Act. Um, one of the amendments that I was, I know, as a parent I was so pleased with was um, luring, um, criminal offenses for luring and also for sharing of videos. Mm -hmm. Talk about that one. Revenge porn. Yeah, revenge yeah. porn. There it is. Bermuda is another world, but we're very much um, in line with some of the, I would call them antisocial and damaging behaviors that are demonstrated worldwide. And as we become more sexually permissive, um, you will find people using that permissiveness and consent in ways that are not beneficial in sexual relationships. And so it was necessary to enact legislation to really just put the brakes on revenge point. Okay, relationships don't always work out. And people are in intimate relationships and do intimate things that are meant to stay within the relationship. And when you have non-consensual sharing of intimate images, it's a problem. And we had um, activity early on with the, our young people in that regard. And the damage that that does, the shame, everything that goes with that when you're making what we now would call bad choices at that age. Um, it was necessary to do a legislative intervention, so I'm pleased that we were able to provide that level of protection. Luring uh, was a response to a very specific request from a member of the public who was a victim. And this is a really, really um, interesting partnership that speaks of service. Okay, we don't often um, action the complaints that we get, the concerns that we get. We try to, but some things are not possible. So when this member of the public who was imminently vulnerable at a very early stage in her life um, was victimized in that manner, it was necessary to act. Yeah, yeah. it was necessary to act. And we're now going to the second stage of that mm -hmm. because there's a limitation period on when these offenses can be dealt with. And so we're looking to remove that as well. Excellent. Yeah. So Excellent. You continue. <laughs> Good. Well, we're going to come back. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a short break. We're going to come back. Uh, so many things I want to ask you. Uh, we, we're going to come back. We'll be right back with the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, the Honorable Kathy Lynn Simmons. <laughs> When I was growing up, my mom was extremely tidy. 
We were trained to put things back where we got them from. One day, when I walked into my mom's house, I felt like I walked to someone else's house. There was stuff everywhere. And just growing up, the way I grew up, and to see this transition was very alarming. When Sean talked to me, it was a wake-up call, and that's when I went to the doctor. And we are back with the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, the Honorable Kathy Lynn Simmons. So much to discuss, mm -hmm. but I'm going to bring up one that I think everybody will want to talk about. I think it was in the throne speech as well as um, discussion. L reform mm -hmm. to the Landlord-Tenant Act legislation. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Landlord-Tenant legislation. Um, particularly in this climate where, you know, there's, um, you know, housing shortages and so forth and the rights being protected, the landlord and the tenant. What can we expect from the Attorney General's chambers this okay. year? We can expect legislation that seeks to strike a balance between what can be considered to be competing interests. Mm -hmm. So the protections of the tenants include protection from harassment, um, policy around what they do with deposits. Um, we have landlords who use all sorts of unethical behavior to basically scare a tenant out, make it untenable for them to be there. Uh, but we also have a policy where we're trying to get more landlords to put their houses in the rental stock. Okay, And what that means is that the conditions surrounding that have to be beneficial to landlords. Yeah, right now we have a long process to get an order for possession. And this is a two-way street because landlords sometimes allow the arrears to run up to a point where, you know, it impacts them very negatively in terms of mortgages, et cetera. So what we're trying to do is have a streamlined um, process for evictions, but at the same time try to um, expedite it in terms of when you come forward. So don't wait seven months, don't wait two years, and then you get to the court, the tenant is um, unemployed, and your return is you get a judgment for $10 a month, $150 a month, how does that serve you? And then we get the cry that you know your mortgage is, is in jeopardy. And so it's very difficult to balance the two. So interestingly enough, I'm trying to find incentives for landlords to put their properties in, in the housing stock. Um, likewise, I'm trying to ensure that tenants are protected. They need some security of tenure. They need their deposits to be dealt with properly. They need to have the repair obligations um, respected. Um, we don't have laws surrounding rights for borders and licensees. So it's, there's a whole landscape um, of persons in this, this um, construct that we need to to protect and likewise um, penalize where appropriate and effectively. So you can expect to see legislation very soon, um, most likely before April. Um, the policy will be put out for public um, consultation because we need the people to weigh in who are affected. Um, we've had feedback from the Rent Commission. Um, we've had feedback from Consumer Affairs because the protections come through them and they are frontline and they're the ones who are in receipt of the complaints. So right now I do have a cab paper. I do have an annex that outlines the reforms for the cabinet to opine on. And then we'll go from there. But I intend to keep the public um, fully abreast of developments in this area, and I welcome the feedback that will come. Let me put it out for consultation. Okay, so, so you will put it's something topical up. and it's um, in train. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, especially as you said, um, even the incentives. It's going to be interesting to see mm -hmm. the incentives to put them out there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, especially now with the whole introduce the introduction of vacation property rentals and yeah. all of that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's striking a balance, as you mm -hmm. said. Definitely mm -hmm. striking a balance. But there are times, Tina, I will confess that, you know, the scales will be tipped yeah. in one direction or the other, okay? Yeah. There are some absolutes when it comes to either of the parties that we need to make sure we protect. Yeah. Tenants need to be protected at all costs, yeah? But tenants also have a responsibility to live up to their obligations on the lease, and primarily that's to pay rent yeah. in a timely yeah. manner, yeah? yeah. One of the things that we were talking this week in government that's mm -hmm. in the news, of course, is the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board, mm -hmm. which is a board that y you have oversight over then? Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the concerns is that um, 
it's not a user-friendly process. Mm -hmm. um, people may not be getting the compensation that they want. Is this something that you're looking into? Yeah, absolutely. We've had a recent um, judgment of the Court of Appeal that speaks to some of the issues. Um, this is not something that we run from. What we try to do is assess our boards and committees and our programs throughout um, um, the year. What's difficult is when certain things are not communicated in a manner that allows us to jump on it. But I'm grateful we had a report by the Ombudsman um, last year, the year before, that spoke to some of the administrative um, nightmares that were occurring in relation to the process. Where I am now is I'm pleased that we amended the law to make the chair a lawyer as opposed to a member of the judiciary, and that allowed more time to be put um, into the subject matter so we didn't have the backlog. So the backlog has been cleared. Um, we also have a dedicated administrative um, resource that allows the process to run more smoothly. What I was not aware of was that we were having challenges with the um, time constraints for the applications. Having now had um, well, been informed, um, I think that it's um, a logical next step to make sure that the programs um, serve the public in the manner that they're meant to, that we amend the law to ensure that the time limits are not prohibited. And we all know how difficult it is to get a death certificate. We all know how difficult it is to get medical records from overseas. So once I meet with the chair and understand better the practical implications of the administrative um, um, administration of the scheme, then we can make the necessary um, adjustments so that the public is better served. One of the things that the Court of Appeal did um, speak to is the possibility of an ex gratia payment being made to people who were unfortunately um, disadvantaged because the process may not have been as transparent, i.e. the signpost, okay, you have two years, you have two weeks, you have two months, you have a day, whatever the restrictions are as relates to time that are prescribed by legislation, I do think that we need to have this more publicly available and understood. And so we will be considering um, how to best make sure that justice is served and that these people have been through some of the most traumatic experiences yeah. that you can imagine from a human perspective are rightly compensated. Yeah. And so this is nothing that you run away from. This is something that you, you know, um, seek to address head on so that the process is efficient and fair. Yeah. 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 And and speaking of that, you know, knowing, you know, I know the whole throne speech talked about, you know, really uh, modernizing a lot of the processes mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and making sure people know and mm -hmm. so forth. One of the ones that I know you and I have talked about privately is uh, when you introduced the no fault divorce. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now we got a big hurrah from a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But um, are the processes is in place now for... Yeah, the forms are available to make the applications. Most people are still going through a lawyer. It was our hope that we would be able to make it more user-friendly so that people did not incur the cost of having to go through the process. So having removed the component of having to um, plead particulars, i.e. say why, you know, you can no longer live with this person, et cetera, et cetera, which led to some of the additional conflict in these relationships and resolution of them through divorce proceedings, we now need to make sure that the process, the administrative process, is smoother. Clearly, I don't intervene in the court process, right. okay? Right. That's a separate and independent um, process, but we have a responsibility to make sure, in conjunction with um, the registry, that people are readily um, able to use the processes associated with no fault divorce. Okay. And so, again, this is one of our programs that we assess and make sure that it's um, fit for purpose. And I have not had any complaints in that regard, but having been through the recent experience of criminal injuries compensation, I think it would be timely to do a general overview of our programs and committees to make sure that they're serving as they are meant to um, service our, our population. But I will say this, Tina, one of the things in the ministry that we have are people who volunteer to serve on these boards and committees at a stipend, and they give up their time and expertise, and we're ever grateful for the service and um, assistance that they provide, but it's our role to make sure that the outcome is, is as um, intended. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, recently on one of uh, another show, <laughs> a local show, 
the uh, the uh, the host said, "Our laws are archaic. Mm -hmm. We need to do something with the laws in Bermuda." And you know, as she's been explaining, as you you have been explaining, is that you know it is a process. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you say to that? You know, our laws are archaic, and we need to be changing them. Yeah. Well, general statements don't um, add any value to the action necessary to resolve True. the situation. And so we have a law reform commission. The law reform commission. Um, has been staffed. Um, we have a director of law reform. Um, we also have a commission that has been tasked with keeping the laws under review. What that means in practice, there is um, um, an opportunity for members of the public to provide um, input to the Law Reform Commission as to what they would like to see um, certain projects and I'll, I'll be, you know, I'm happy to say actually that we have had feedback from the um, public as to what areas they would like to see um, as a subject of reform. Are we a bit slow? I think we're a bit slow. Yeah, we're a bit slow. I mean, some of the proposals that have come to my attention have not fit under my desired banner of social justice, but generally, every ministry and minister operates within the statutory framework, and we regularly make amendments to that statutory framework, and that's what you see every, you know, session going through the legislature. Mm -hmm. Where we have... Um, laws that are not fit for purpose, yeah. including the Constitution, and we're going to talk about that today, yeah. um, you know, there is always the opportunity to pick an area and focus on that. Yeah. Do we have the resources to be everywhere at the same time? Absolutely not. So the things that most impact our people are the things that we tend to focus on. I mean, we do have mortgage reform coming through um, the pipelines as well, and that's a huge um, impactful um, process and policy initiative that will benefit our people and get the law up to date so that we're at least on par with other jurisdictions who are more modernized in that regard. But it's an ongoing process. I'm pleased that we have a dedicated resource. The law does provide for us to get expert advice through committee structure. And this is something that we have to fund more effectively and be more aggressive in um, advancing. Yeah. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and you're right, you know, general terms about it being archaic. At the end of the throne speech, I think it was something that said, the, the and you were explaining it, how the ministries will be doing this this law, looking mm -hmm. at this law. Mm -hmm. Is Does that fall all under your purview, or does it fall also under the ministries as well? Amendments to the Companies Act, amendments to so, this... We have the legislative drafting section in the Attorney General's chamber. So everything that gets sent to the House of Assembly is drafted in chambers. The process is that the ministries submit their proposals, the legislative proposals, they're reviewed by my team, they're sanctioned by myself, and then they go through a process of drafting. This is after cabinet approval. Um, and we get the end result that you see tabled in the House of Assembly. But everything that's listed, we actually have to um, translate the policy into law. Yeah. yeah. And that's a human's job because it was a, oh, yeah, uh, a it was a full team. list. Yeah, have you have a, a wonderful team of, of this. Yeah, of parliamentary draft. council, that's our official title. And um, we recently had a retirement with Lorraine Welch, a former chief parliamentary council, one of our very senior drafters who has provided sterling service to the government, but we have a team of Bermudians who are eminently qualified to advance the government's legislative initiative. So it's a reciprocal relationship and process that we engage in with the ministries every single day. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. In the seven years since you've been in, mm. one or two highlights. Can you think of a royal quick? I, <laughs> I know because we're... Number one, child safeguarding. Yeah. Yeah, that is near and dear to my heart. And you recall, Tina, that DCFS was one of my um, departments. And I can't think of anything more laudable than advancing statutory protections for our children. Yeah, yeah. and that is um, something that will continue to advance under the auspices of the um, new ministry, which I hope is expanded to um, at more areas that speak to the social protections that are necessary. So that is a collaborative effort through all the agencies in government, right. and I think it's yielding some results. So people know, you know, that we are um, prioritizing the safety of our young people, particularly our children. Yeah. yeah. Working very much behind the scenes. You know, we don't get you on camera often. Yeah. But um, we know that your, your team, as you said, the drafters mm -hmm. and everyone in, in your team, the Crown Council, mm -hmm. 
um, are very, very busy. Um, but we will, hopefully we'll get you back here uh, to talk about some more things that are coming up um, within the ministry. Yes? My pleasure, Tina. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking with the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, the Honorable Kathy Lynn Simmons. I'm Tina Evans, and thank you for joining us on This Week in Government.